Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar focused on product life cycle and local assembly. While we wait that you all join the webinar, I'm going to ask to uh, mute. Yeah, so everybody is uh, muted now, so there are no background noises. I'm going to give uh, one more minute for everybody to join. As internet sometimes is a little bit slow, we need some extra time. So sorry for those who were uh, on time. So I was saying uh, that I am Jackie Garcia and I'm part of the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge team and the facilitator of this webinar today. As a reminder, these webinars are designed for participants of the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge, which is an initiative led by Efficiency for Access with support from Engineers Without Borders UK. This webinar is being recorded and the cameras and microphones of the attendees are disabled, except for those of the main speakers. But you all can use the chat box to make any comments or the Q um, and A um, section for questions for our speakers at any time, and will we discuss them um, later on? Hopefully, you can uh, locate the chat box and feel free uh, to share any comments and and questions. Hopefully, you can hear me well. Uh, let me start with the um, agenda for this webinar for the product lifecycle and local assembly. So we will have three guest speakers talking about the product life cycle, e-waste and local assembly. Then we'll have space for Q and A, questions and answers. And then we will share a short webinar feedback to collect some of your comments on the webinar. Before introducing our guest speakers, I would like to ask the audience some questions. We have students and academics from different universities and countries attending today, so I'm interested to know the general understanding of these topics and your previous exposure to these themes, either at an academic level or from a personal interest point of view. So the first question for the attendees is, um, how would you rate your current knowledge on product life cycle? You will have a pop-up window where you have the question and different options to respond. So you can say, excellent, I know a lot about the topic. Okay, I know a little and I want to expand my knowledge. Not much, I want to learn more or nothing at all. I don't know what the product life cycle is. So you can just um, answer what is more accurate for you. There are no right or wrong question answer, excuse me, <laughs> it's only just to go um, general feeling on that. So it looks like 60% of you, um, you have a, an okay knowledge, but want to expand your, um, what you know already. So the second question, it's does your current course or degrees curriculum include product life cycle subjects? Yes, no, or I don't know. Should be pretty straightforward. Okay, so Paul is moving, responses are arriving. moving a lot. <laughs> okay, it seems like uh, we have 33% um, that yes, you have uh, some kind of exposure to um, through the um, current course or degree that you are studying. 44% uh, doesn't and 22% uh, doesn't know. It's okay, I mean, we will learn some things today. So now let me introduce the speakers. 
we have, uh, sorry, Mr. David Tusubira. It's a tech entrepreneur, currently is chief technical officer and co-founder of Innovex, using Internet of Things technology to promote access to solar energy in sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Uh, Tutsubira holds a bachelor degree in electrical engineering from Makerere University, hardware, hardware developer with a background in robotics. We have also Dr. Laura Allerston, is a head of grants and research at Acceleron and concentrates on grant funding opportunities to enable development of R&D efforts and scaling project work in Africa. She has a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Birmingham with work also completed in the IIL at University College London, which focus on hydrogen fuel cells and electrolyzers. Sounds very exciting. Mr. Viraj Gautam, the, sorry. Um, Mr. Viraj Gautam is the Chief Executive Officer of People Engineer and Energy and Environmental Development Association, PIDA. He brings more than 12 years of professional experience in management leader and an environmental professional. He has extensive work experience as an environmental energy practitioner on various research and development projects related to hydropower development, rural electrification, solar wind, hybrid system, electric cooking, etc., etc. Mr. Gautam holds a Master's on Science in Environmental Science from Huan University in Nepal. Now, without further ado, David, the floor is yours for your um, insight on the, on the topics. Uh, hi everyone, um, happy to be here and uh, happy to have uh, everyone that has attended and uh, also I'm glad for the uh, opportunity. I hope I hope I can you can hear me properly. Yes. Great, great. So um, uh, as, as Jackie already introduced me, CTO of Innovex, uh, a company that has been in business for about five years and uh, our core business is uh, manufacturing of, uh, of, of IoT devices that are used for remote monitoring of, of off-grid solar systems, off-grid PV solar systems. So right from the beginning, we've been involved in the, in the design and production of a particular hardware device. And so hence my, my being here, I guess. Um, so, talking about uh, the three things as product life cycle, e waste, and local assembly, um, the best I can offer you is my experience. Um, so, as any product, our device, which is called the Davix, is named after me, um, first starts with the first phase, which is the introduction. So, we designed the product and we made the first prototype, and uh, we, we identified the pilots in pilot testing partner who was a that was a solar company and uh, they they bought the first unit and we installed it on, on, on one of their solar systems and uh, this was the first time they ever experienced um, getting real-time data from a solar system that's installed somewhere far away they had never experienced this and and the reason why they they wanted this was because you know solar systems fail, and as a person who has a solar solar system or has sold a solar system to a customer, could be a hospital, school, or an individual in the home, you want to know why it failed as the person who provided this, because you want to offer better services. So it was a great experience for them, but the product actually failed a couple of times, um, and. We, the same piloting company gave us an opportunity to install more hardware, more hardware, more solar systems that are uh, up country. And uh, with, that, with that practice, we kept on improving the product and improving the product. So, so that's the first stage, right? The introduction, introducing the product to the market. So what I would say about that is the most important thing is, is piloting and test, right? Um, you want to get a piloting, a piloting customer who actually needs the product and relies on it because that's the only way they're going to give you great feedback. And uh, naturally, with that, the product will grow and 
it will get into the growth stage, right? So, so in the growth stage is where the popularity of the product is growing. In our case, that is expanding it to other customers or other solar companies that are willing to try out the product. Um, and so that I, I think that started maybe after an entire year. So we spent an entire year in what you probably call the introduction phase. And uh, we've been in the growth stage uh, uh, right now. So the growth phase, like I said, is where the product is getting more and more popular in the market. And so far we have accumulated about 20 customers, some within our country and some in neighboring countries. So we've had customers in Kenya, some in Tanzania, some in the DRC, um, and some in Somalia, Ethiopia. And these people enjoy the product, they've used it, um, it works for them. I would like to say that we are still in the growth stage because ourselves to be in the in the maturity stage right uh, in the maturity stage where our product we don't spend that much on marketing or we do not we do not put that much effort into product um, product development or r d for the same particular product maybe we'll be expanding the product line but not necessarily make changing that much on the product um, and uh, I hope that, that the decline stage, which I think is the last stage, does not happen anytime soon. <laughs> but um, so just to tell you where we are right now, I think we are in the growth stage because we're still investing a lot of money in marketing and the product is not as popular as it might need to be. So that's, that's what I'd say about the product life cycle. And of course, well, another thing I can add about the life cycle is the growth stage, of course, is the most important because it's what catapults you into maturity stage. And in the growth stage, your task as the, the maker of this product is, is to make it as good as possible. So everybody who has an iPhone swears by it. So can your product be as good as that? Uh, people who drive the Tesla Model S now swear by it. So that means that they have probably reached the, the growth stage as well, probably even exceeded that. Um, so, I would like to skip over to uh, something else. So local assembly, again, here I'll share my experience with local assembly. Our product is locally assembled. Although, of course, uh, we're based in Kampala, Uganda, and uh, in Uganda, you don't have that much going on in regards to uh, manufacturing and fabrication of, of high-tech electronic devices. Uh, our device is an IoT device, so you know, it's got resistors, capacitors, microcontrollers, and it's got an enclosure on a PCB, and there's nobody that does that kind of fabrication in Uganda. So it's depending on your locale, of course, your assembly, you will have to, you know, apportion your assembly in different places, and maybe the, the local assembly is reduced. So in our case, uh, our product starts with a PCB, manufacturing and then the PCB assembly where the components are placed onto the PCB and both processes have been done in China in the past from the beginning up until up actually up to the middle of this year we've been we'll be relying on the Chinese to to do the PCB manufacturing and assembly so these printed circuit boards come into Uganda already assembled and then what we do is we put them into the enclosures and then we we put we we program the firmware onto them and we test them and then we sell them off, right? So, so it's, it's maybe like a 20% component of the full assembly of the product that has been occurring um, locally. However, um, we were able to secure a, a grant uh, of about $220,000 uh, last year, actually towards the end of 2019, which was basically enabling us to explore the option of local, full local assembly. And, and uh, as we speak right now, we have we have received the equipment that will enable us to do the assembly of of, of PCB PCB, meaning that uh, by by the second half of this year, we will only be 
doing the PCB printed circuit board manufacturing in China. However, the assembly will be happening here. So we have made we have made a small leap by taking by taking back a little bit of the assembly. Although right now we do not know how cost effective it is, uh, it might we might find out by the end of the year that hey, it, it actually doesn't make sense for this assembly line and this product for this assembly line to only be pro producing this product because the numbers, like for instance, the assembly line can do about 300 units a day, but we expect to sell 300 units a month. You know, so so it, it's it might be a bit too extravagant to have an assembly line here. Uh, and in that case, then the, the, we may have to revert back to what we were doing before. So with local assembly, you need to figure out what makes sense financially. Everyone would like to assemble their product from start to finish, of course, because you want to control the process and that gives you more control of the quality. But if it does not make sense financially, then you're not going to do it. Um, at least what, what's important is the final bit, which is the testing that I'm the firmware uploading onto the device. So, so what I would say about local assembly is, you, if if you have a product, you should try as much as possible to produce produce it locally. But if it does not make financial sense, then of course, you know, you have to you have to be willing to let other people do do certain bits of the assembly for you. Um, and then, lastly, e-waste. Uh, so what happens with our product is, of course, we assemble the hardware, uh, we sell it to the customer, which is a solar company, and and they will install it on the solar system. But um, of course, this is, a, this is an electronic device; it's not supposed to work forever and ever. So obviously, it, it in itself has its life cycle. There will be a time when it will not be functioning, and. We have only been in business for about five years. We've only sold about 1,000 units of hardware so far. And so because we've only been in business for like five years, we don't have any, any product out there that has outlived its, its uh, relevance. So we have not yet been uh, confronted with, with, uh, with the reality of what happens to this device when it's, it's no longer in use or no longer needed or it's defective because it's worked for too long and it's given up. Um, however, we have kind of thought about it and we have been exploring uh, different ways of, of handling that e-waste because that's technically what our product would become, e-waste. Um, what we're thinking is to develop a mechanism in which we collect out of use hardware back at the office. And we want to do this even before we think about investing in an e-waste management system. So the first step is how do you get back the e-waste, right? Um, so we're thinking of collecting back e-waste because I think when somebody purchases a solar system with a monitoring system, they want that to be there all the time. So if they if 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 it's if the device that they have is too old, they might want a new one. So it's, it will be easy for us to collect the old one. And we can pile up the old ones in the meantime until we're able to invest in, in an e-waste management, or we can partner with, with somebody else in our local who has, who has some kind of, uh, of e-waste management system where we can maybe reclaim some materials or put, put everything to, to good use. I mean, we, part of the grant was also getting injection molding equipment and our enclosures are, are plastic, so we can definitely recycle the plastic enclosures. Um, the printed circuit boards are the more complex part, but I think there are ways to deal with that as well. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, in that short time, I've given you a, a rundown of my experience with the, with the three items uh, on the topic. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. We will have some time at the end for some questions. Um, so I encourage all the attendees to start writing your questions in the chat box for David or for all the other panelists. And now I want to give the floor to um, Laura. I will be changing the slides for you. So you please let me know when you want me to change your slides. Brilliant, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. 
Um, so hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well and that you find the talks today useful. Um, so my personal interests lie in low carbon energies such as fuel cells and batteries, as well as increasing energy access to ensure as many people as possible have access to secure, affordable, sustainable energy. So Acceleron share these values and we produce lithium ion batteries with their circular economy in mind. Um, could you just, sorry, could you just go to my first slide? Is that available? Has it moved? No. Sorry, um, just give me one second. Oh, that's that's moving now. Yeah, okay. perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so batteries are a great option for increasing energy access. Their ability to store clean energy means people will be able to use their energy day and night. Um, so for example, with solar energy, um, it must be used immediately um, as it's typically produced during sunlight hours. So unless it is stored, um, which the battery can do. And the incumbent battery technology here was typically the lead acid battery. And while these lead acid batteries are cheap and sustainable, um, they're also about 100% recyclable, which is obviously fantastic. Um, the lithium ion does have many benefits over these lead acid batteries. So they're typically more lightweight, um, often up to a third the weight for the same capacity available. Um, and the lifetimes are far better, meaning less interrupted supply. Um, and it can also reduce the total cost of ownership for the owner. So additionally, um, although lead acid is almost 100% recyclable, as I just said, um, there are issues with recycling um, of those lead acid batteries um, and recycling plants across Africa um, are bringing issues such as low to mid cost practices, um, such as backyard and low standard industrial smelting have low lead recovery rates um, and they're most importantly there, they're very polluting and um, particularly to local people in that area. Um, and whilst there is the alternative of high standard industrial smelting and um, the costs and the both the install costs and the operational costs are making that not competitive. So um, currently it, it is slightly difficult to recycle those lead acid batteries. So moving on to lithium then which is what um, we produce they are many people are moving across to those batteries <clears throat> excuse me um and the, they are much more expensive it's often outweighs, outweighed by those benefits i just mentioned so the the major problem with these lithium ion batteries is their recyclability um, so as it, it shows on this slide where we're talking about here, the, there's not currently any recycling methods in Africa um, other than sort of really small demonstrators. And there's also none in the UK really either. So um, all the um, battery recycling would typically need to be shipped to Europe. Um, so obviously this would would then rely on high and fluctuating logistics costs to move the batteries to recycling. Um, and so one of the reasons for this is the method of recycling is much more difficult for lithium um, and the materials involved hold much less value than, for example, the lead coming out of the lead acid batteries. So therefore reducing the economic reasons behind the need to recycle. So the number of um, electric vehicles and batteries for energy storage increases, we must consider the batteries at their end of life. So one of the figures um, is that by 2040, there is expected to be around 44 million EVs on the road every year. And that alone would produce 22 million meters cubed of battery waste. Um, and there's some examples on this slide to help you visualize how much this. <laughs> So, um, and as England are playing India in the cricket today, I'm going to use the Melbourne cricket ground as the example. Um, and at 1.5 million meters cubed in that cricket ground, we'd need 14 of those to contain that waste, which is, you know, and that's literally only the EV vehicle waste. And it's not considering the large amount of waste expected from 
the home energy storage and other applications such as light mobility. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so this is where Acceleron comes in. Our battery design is built with the circular economy in mind. So unlike traditional methods of assembly, where all cells are welded together within a pack, and if a single cell or a number of those cells go wrong, the entire pack would need to be thrown away. So our patent, um, Acceleron's patent, lies in our non-permanent assembly method. So we actually use compression to put our batteries together. Um, and this allows us to maintain and service our batteries over their lifetime, and it, that really extends their lifetime um, and reduces the waste and also can reduce the total cost of ownership for the customer as well. So we are able to use this technology both with first life cells and to, to produce brand new batteries, which we sell in the UK, Europe, um, the Caribbean and Africa. Um, and the, we're able to use that design as well to repurpose second life cells. Um, just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the needs for battery customers vary greatly depending on their market um, and the use case as well. So we produce different batteries and different business models for those markets. So we've worked with some great partners to do this as well, um, to deliver projects over the years, such as Total, um, Tata and Bbox, um, and a couple of others are mentioned at the bottom as well. Um, so the ability to upgrade our batteries as new cells come to the market, as well as their maintainability, means that um, they work very well for such markets as data centers, um, typically where they would need to install a solution which will work for years to come. So we're able to place batteries in an energy as a service model as well, um, or ESAS as a lot of people call it. Um, and that allows us to provide solar home systems for a small monthly fee, um, allowing greater access to energy for those who can't actually afford their CapEx upfront. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we're able to test and repurpose batteries um, which come into the waste stream. So if you could just go to the next slide again, and I'll just quickly go through the process of that. Um, so this is our process in, in Kenya that we work towards. Um, so we work with the We Center there. Um, so they're a, a waste center that um, typically take in a lot of different e-waste from, from across Kenya, um, based in Nairobi. Um, and so they're, they're initially collected and sorted. Um, and then we move forward into the final disassembly of those initial battery packs. Um, and we can then check, you know, if any of them are particularly rusty or, or look bad, then we wouldn't necessarily test those as they can be dangerous. Um, and so any cells that pass through that initial stage would move forward to the um, cell testing stage. Um, which we look at voltage and um, internal resistance um, and they go, go through a full charge and discharge cycle um, which the data from then goes into algorithms to um, ensure whether they can be moved forward and put into um, a pack for a second life. Um, and then these cells are sorted and grouped and then they would be placed within packs and then can be sold on. Um, so that's just a little bit about that process. Um, I think that's kind of all the slides I had, but I just wanted to talk about some of the issues that we see as, as a company and hopefully, um, you know, that might provide some, some insight into things that you could do as part of your challenge and things to consider. Um, so we, we, as I mentioned, we're doing that process in Kenya now and we've been doing that for the last few years um, and we're currently expanding that process into Rwanda as well. Um, so as with all businesses, there are many challenges to overcome and they really depend on geography and market. Um, so sticking to Kenya for now, I'll, I'll mention some of the issues we've faced there. Um, so as it's batteries, um, the safety is a really big one and it must always be considered. Um, they're able to explode or cause fires, um, particularly when not handled correctly. Um, and so while this must be considered for staff, staff safety in, in the business, it also must be considered for the customer as well. Um, so things to consider there is that 
you know, the batteries must be really well contained in a box because typically if somebody can open a box, they will. Um, and if that could happen, then, you know, they could move things about and, and cause a, cause an injury. So there's just, uh, there's a lot of risk assessments and fire and safety equipment is required. Um, and that's all, you know, highly costly. So that's just one of the, the big things to consider there. Um, one of the other challenges we've come across is the cost of poor quality first life batteries um, which are on the market and generally they're built with poor quality cells and they would last maybe one year or um, uh, only slightly more um, and the market acceptance of something termed second life which is is what we do um, is you know it, it kind of has a, a negative thought in some people's minds um, and so we've actually done studies to show that our second life batteries are frequently much better than the first life batteries on the market so just getting that across pe to people and and getting rid of that public perception of second life and waste is is kind of one of the key barriers to entry to the market um so then just quickly going back to, to safety, the certification of batteries is actually a really good way to ensure the safety of the battery products. Um, and typically any battery sold in the UK must go through a certification um, and that's done by an external body. Um, unfortunately, that's still really difficult with second life batteries um, and the standards are not quite there yet. Um, and so it really means that the onerous is on the company themselves to ensure that the product is up to a good standard and won't cause any safety issues. Excuse me. Um, so then again, because of the, the second life nature of our products in Kenya and the supply chain is really important and it, it's often a challenge. Um, so it, it really depends upon the, the stable supply of those waste cells, which we can use to produce those products. And as I mentioned, we work with the, with the waste centre there and they've been absolutely fantastic in ensuring that we do have that standard and um, reliable supply of, of cells. Um, but a supply chain that is reliable is always something that, that needs to be considered to ensure that you um, have that product at the end of your production line so that, that it is able to be sold when you expect to be able to sell it. Um, and then just moving on to logistics, um, it's it's difficult for a few reasons, particularly for us, um, batteries must be um, shipped under um, dangerous goods. Um, and so that that obviously increases the cost. Um, but even more so because of because of COVID at the moment, the shipping costs have really been pushed up um, and just increased the time scales. So as you can Im imagine, that really impacts business models. If you expect to be able to ship to your customer for a certain price, and that fits well for them um, and you that you know that would typically be your business model but this just really brings in an external factor that you can't necessarily control um, and so it's just things like that those type of risks that need to be need to be considered really and if you're able to consider anything like that then that's fantastic um, and then just, just finally, I just wanted to mention that if you're able to um, have that local supply chain, um, that's you know a really good way to go. Um, local people tend to know the, the market and the area much better. Um, and so it would give you a, a running start. Um, so then hopefully as a business, you could, you could repair that by um, providing training and jobs to the local area um, and therefore typically increasing knowledge as well. Um, and if that if that local area and local supply chain is possible, um, it's it's really useful to try and consider gender equality in any roles, really, um, because as we all know, um, females in in energy and tech and engineering is is quite rare. Um, and so if you are able to consider that and make a positive impact of how to get more women involved at a younger age through workshops or you know just even in your hiring processes if you can try and hire women there then it, it's a really good first step and hopefully we can um make it a more gender neutral um workforce so hopefully i've covered a few areas there um that you can consider but yeah that's where i'm to thanks 
Thank you very much, Laura, especially for uh, that last remark about uh, gender balance, gender equality, etc. It's super important. Um, we will have some questions after the, the next uh, speaker. So um, just rem a reminder to write your questions on the chat. And now, Viraj, um, the floor is yours if you can um, join us, because I, I know that you are having some technical problems, hopefully it's all solved, and you can unmute yourself and share some of your expertise. Viraj, are you there? I think... Hello, Viraj? Yes. Hello. Hi, we, we can hear you, but if you are having problems, don't worry about the camera. No, now you went offline, I think. It's challenging these days with all the internet technologies. Okay, well, while we give some time to Viraj to, to join us again. Hi, we can hear you now. Viraj? We can, well, actually can we can hear your phone call, uh, ringing, <laughs> but we can hear you, yes, go ahead. Uh, can, can you, you try please to... hear me? Yeah, we hear uh, you. Hello? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm so sorry. So I have uh, a bit uh, uh, up and down this internet. So thank you, uh, Jacqueline, for uh, giving this space here. And also, it was great to hear David and Laura. So uh, unlike them, so. Um, uh, I, I I represent from NGO, so we are not uh, any manufacturing companies. So so we are more uh, into like use of their products to our communities. So as uh, as Jackie said, uh, my name is Viraj Gautam. I work with uh, People, Energy, and Environment Development Association. Uh, PIDA is an NGO based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, we uh, are working in energy sector since 1997. Uh, PIDA mainly works in the areas of energy and environment, uh, but our special focus is in uh, renewable energy technology services to the underserved communities in Nepal. In the past, we have been working many renewable energy projects, such as solar powered water lifting projects, electric cooking projects, uh, solar powered uh, cold storage facilities uh, in the uh, community, so a small scale five metric ton, and community electrification projects through the use of solar and wind hybrid projects, and also micro hydro projects in various parts of Nepal. All the technology except the micro hydro, we have been importing those technologies from abroad, either from India or China or other countries. But uh, we do have mixed experience with the imported technology during the post project phase because of not having local expertise in the country. That's why uh, in today's uh, discussion, I would like to share about not having the local man manufacturing facility and also uh, capacity of repair and maintenance in the post project phase. So uh, my focus uh, will be a little bit with the uh, electric project, electric cooking project that we are doing uh, in the large scale at, at the moment. So to give you a little bit of uh, uh, information about the current context of Nepal. So okay, do you hear me, Jackie? Yes, we okay, can hear you. <laughs> so currently around 92% of Nepalese households do get uh, the access to electricity with the increasing number of households having connected to electricity and country moving towards improving quality of electricity 
government of Nepal and number of other organizations like PIDA are working to promote electric cooking in Nepal. So the promotion of electric cooking is in very early stage, but the government has targeted to ensure 25%, which is roughly around one and a half million households, uh, start using electric cooking as a primary cook stoves for their cooking by 2030. Our previous study had found that electric cooking devices are being liked by the users when they were supported with the required knowledge and education on the use and benefit of such stoves. Following the acceptance of e-cookers by the community and the campaign by the government to promote the electric cooking will surely increase in the, uh, the demand of such stoves. But ironically, all the uh, cooking stoves and cooking devices are imported from foreign countries. So we don't have any manufacturing units that uh, manufactures electric cook stoves. In, in other areas also, we do not have that much manufacturing capacity. But since this uh, electric cook stoves, uh, we want to promote in large scale, but still we don't have any manufacturing facility. Uh, so the important uh, technology has its uh, one uh, benefits and also uh, uh, also bad uh, bad sides of it. So high cost and complexity of overseas developed and patented designs of equipment may pre prevent this widespread implementation, especially in low income countries like Nepal, where the need for such converters is high to support development efforts. Solutions that are I think we lost you there, uh, Virash. We can hear you now. No. I don't know if it's only my problem, but um, I cannot hear you, Virash. No. Yeah, sorry. For example, yes. the uh, current, uh, <laughs> current uh, technology we have been using are mostly uh, made for the uh, abroad things like for example they don't have uh, some sort of features that helps us to cook roti that is the local food and all these things so those kind of things can also be uh, addressed when we can do the local manufacturing uh, to overcome these challenges system and products must be able to be manufactured using local industry enabling a local knowledge base to build and provide low maintenance repair and end of life services the use of shared knowledge sometimes referred to as commons within local workshops enables products to be designed globally by a team such as yours like uh, the students and uh, the professors that now are engaged uh, in the field uh, technology transfer to the country-based manufacturers to make prioritized sector resilient, sustainable, and jobs provider in the country. So we we believe like three step support solution can help uh, in the uh, establishment of the uh, local manufacturing. So understand the local context. So first, uh, before we design anything, we try to understand the local context. Then develop a design. Uh, and uh, connect with the local manufacturers to connect the products, then do some local research and field testing stages to ensure the product is suitable for the application. So in this part, uh, the students can uh, be connected as a lower asset, local uh, community engagement organizations such as PIDA and other organizations. Uh, so I would like to give like one of the examples how we faced uh, difficulties when we did the uh, in the uh, electric cookie stoves project in the past. In one of our research projects, uh, so we did some laboratory research and we found that one kilowatt capacity uh, was sufficient to cook most of the Nepalese food, uh, Nepalese food. Uh, but the uh, induction cookie stoves that we wanted to use for that research uh, had uh, two kilowatt rating. So all of the uh, induction cookie stoves that we find in Kathmandu is like 1.8 to 2.3 kilowatt uh, rating. 
since the one kilowatt is sufficient and we wanted to do these things in the weak grid and um, a micro hydro mini grid that means if we uh, bring unnecessary power consumption in those grids then that can hamper the uh, quality of the mini grid sometimes uh, it can also uh, also affect badly to these mini grids that's why we wanted to use like one kilowatt system then so there was not uh, any product that was that was available in this market and we can do modify that to one kilowatt then we had to import those products from india especially for this purpose and they came and we modified and we sent it to the uh, community so they worked uh, worked well for some time so after like uh, a uh, few months couple of products they were broken so it was not working and then suddenly like people who were uh, started using the electric cooking so like uh, clean cooking then they had to go back to the traditional way, way of cooking uh, means the firewood cook, uh, cooking in the firewood so it gave like a little bit bad feeling to them and also there was some sort of problems uh, for the community to uh, repair those things immediately in the local area so for this particular project pida could help those uh, those products uh, bringing them back to kathmandu the capital capital city of nepal and fix them and send them back to the village but we think this is not a sustainable solution for the longer term so what we believe in ensuring a repair and maintenance facility in the local level is also a most important issue to consider for the sustained use of the technology so for this we can develop a simple repair, repair and maintenance manual while developing the product we can make the process simple and ensure the parts are available readily i I think we lost you there again, Viraj. What I'd like to say is, uh, so just give the emphasis to understand the local context while designing the product. And if, if possible, uh, do connect with the local manufacturing companies to ensure the local manufacturing. And also do trials locally to ensure the product, product is suitable and provide some sort of operation and maintenance guidelines when these products go to the market either commercially or for the testing phase and that can ensure the uh, uh, use of product and also uh, dem uh, demand of the product so these are the you know some of the things i wanted to share uh, with you from our experiences in the field uh, thank you for listening and i'm sorry for uh, the interruption and quality of my internet thank you Thank you, Viraj. Thank you very much. Um, we saw for the overcome all the issues with technology, so we could finally hear you very well. Thank you very much. So we are having some uh, questions on the chat. So um, let's move to the Q and A section, and please feel free to ask more questions. So the first question is for Laura. Manasa Maladi, hopefully I pronounce it properly, is asking how much are the but the acceleron batteries? I guess the, the he's asking about the cost. Is there anything you can share there? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Um, yeah, of course. So um, we sell in, in, you know, as I mentioned, a few different business models. Our first life batteries that, that we sell in the UK and, and the Caribbean, um, mostly, um, they're um, sort of the mid to high range of the market. So we're not the, the lower cost batteries that I mentioned. Um, and that's simply because we, you know, they are good batteries and they're, they, as I said, they can really have extended lifetimes. Um, but we don't quite have the really um, the the marketing and the brand knowledge to enable us to go to sort of the really high rates that people like Tesla and, and things put their batteries out there for. Um, our second life batteries, um, we're doing quite a large piece of work on this now to really understand um, where the market is for those prices. What we are trying to do is be really competitive with those first life batteries that I mentioned from um, 
typically from from China that are coming in, um, and that's so that we can provide good batteries um, at a price that that is going to be acceptable to the market and that people can afford, basically. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that's a question. Yeah. Hopefully yes. If not, please, Manasa, um, send us a chat. Next question is for Viraj from Surjadeep Basak is asking for the electric cooking. So how difficult was it to convince the locals to shift from conventional cooking to electric methods? And the second part of the question, well, or comment, is that they are developing an off-grid solar power green for that system. And their concern is to create market demand for the product. Is there anything there you can share, Viraj, if you are still with us? I don't know if uh, you can hear us, Viraj, but uh, you are muted. OK, we will um, share this question with Viraj uh, via email, and we'll get back to you. Um, Surjative with an answer, okay. And then let's move to another question. Um, how do you see the impact of interoperability between different appliances and the systems on reducing e-waste? I don't know who wants to take this um, this question, David or Laura. I imagine David might have some with his IoT. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with, uh, with the interoperability thing. Uh, so, of course, if what you mean by interoper interoperability is, is basically different systems within the same ecosystem being able to interconnect, hence, um, hence uh, so, so let me just give an example, okay? Um, if you're using a Samsung phone and say you're using a, um, a and then you buy, a, a, and then you, are, you maybe there's something happens in Samsung and you buy an iPhone, right? You buy an iPhone, you might realize that, oh, if, if you're to, to, to have a very good experience with the iPhone, I have to get a Mac, right? And then, and then you get the Mac and then you realize, oh, I think, uh, you know, I need to get like a, you need to get an Apple Watch to get a to make a full experience. Um, now, on the opposite side, um, if you're using Android, you can use any kind of laptop, any kind of Android phone, any kind of general and Android watch, and you would still get um, the same functionality. Maybe not to the same quality, but you get the same functionality. Now, the difference is that if you're using an iPhone setting, you're using the iPhone system, or if you're using Apple stuff. Right, you need a full set of Apple stuff to get to get the kind of functionality that you want. Inter um, using stuff, and you something happens to the Android watch, you can buy another Android watch, and it will work with with the Dell laptop and the, and the Samsung phone or Techno phone, right? So of course, interoperability does reduce e-waste because because you don't have to replace a lot of hardware, right? Um, you can replace different bits and pieces because the whatever you get, the replacement you get will be able to work with what you already have, right? So you can replace one piece at a time and whatever piece that you choose to replace, replace in that in your system of operation will still work with whatever was, whatever else was there. Whereas, um, you know, you, if, if you're using a certain system where things are not interoperable, in which case you have to buy a full set of something, then if that full set, if something in that set becomes obsolete, you're, you're tasked with replacing the whole set, and hence the entire obsolete set is e-waste, right? So I don't know if I've made, done a good job of, 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 of uh, showing the difference, but but I think it does arrive to the to the conclusion that interoperability does reduce e-waste, for sure. 
I think, yeah, just to quickly add to what David said there. Um, so taking his example, um, if, for example, you had a, diff a few different methods of, of say, cooking or um, and the actual connection there would be to, say, um, quite a standard connection to either solar panels or to a battery then that could be a really good option to, to reduce the e-waste in, you know, the need to replace um, the entire cooking system because the battery or the, the method for powering that ha has failed. Um, and so, yeah, there's the opportunity for reducing e-waste there as well. Thank you. We are running out of time, but um, there is one question that maybe you can uh, answer uh, very quickly. In your opinion, is zero waste a pipe dream or is something that is feasible? And if feasible, what needs to happen to achieve it? Um, I'll, I'm off mute, so I'll take it quickly. Um, so I think um, it, it's hopefully not a pipe dream. Um, zero waste is, is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, and so I think we need to start now and start as quickly as possible um, and do what we can and um, so and particularly for countries such as um, that are, are developing and, and don't necessarily have that access to energy um, already it's really important that we start with the sustainable energy um, which I think hopefully it could happen and is achievable and so yeah that's my, my two cents. Thank you, Laura. Um, Viraj, it was a question for you, but you were offline. So the question is, how do you convince the local to shift from conventional cooking um, to electric cooking? So if you can very briefly uh, give some tips uh, to this team that is working on a solar off-grid power system. I think you are muted. We cannot hear you. No. We can't. I think you are unmuted, but we cannot hear you. So maybe some problem with the microphone, but don't worry. We can share the question with you, Viraj. No, we cannot hear you, sorry. <laughs> I will share the question with you, Viraj, and um, we will answer the question offline through the email, if that's okay because we cannot hear you, sorry. <laughs> IT problems, don't worry. <laughs> Big thank you to all the speakers and the attendees for being here today with the different time zones and with all the busy um, schedules that you all have. Thank you very much for being here. And now we value all your feedback and we are really keen to hear from the opinion of all the attendees and assess this webinar. And this will help us to improve for future webinars. So we have prepared a very short survey that will take less than one minute and will pop up right after the webinar. So if you can just uh, wait one minute and, and help us improve. Um, also, at the, um, otherwise, um, yeah, we will share later on with the recording the survey. And at this point, I just want to remind that a recording of the webinar will be available on the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge website in case you want to revisit some of the examples and interesting information you have listened here today. And we have two other webinars in March and April, one on affordability and a second one on unintended consequences of the growth of the sector. You will soon receive an invitation through your academics but you also have the links to register on the last Efficiency for Access Design Challenge newsletter. So if you haven't received it yet, you can sign up in this link that it will be posted on the chat box also. And now, yes, uh, thank you very much for all being here. Hopefully you've learned something today. I've done, and thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thanks, bye. Cheers.